In this section, Stephen illustrates how he has taken his fundamental principles and beliefs around empowerment and collaborative change and translated them into the evolving design, remodelling and organisation of Northern Beaches School in Sydney. Now, the, um, the Australian government's response to the global financial crisis was to give every school $3 million. Uh, in the non-government sector, we were able to spend it ourselves. Now, embarrassingly, in the New South Wales government sector, 60% of that money got spent on administration, so only 40% got spent on builds. Um, in our case, we spent $3 million on a building. And to meet the guidelines, we, we, we um, built a sports centre. Um, we were told that the federal government was going to change the regulations for building. We no longer had to go through council. We had, sorry, we had an 18-month window of opportunity to not submit anything to the local council, and we could go five metres higher, and we could go closer to the fence. So I went straight to the architect the next day and said, OK, we go, <laughs> I want a building that's now 12 metres high. It's going to be five metres from that fence. Let's redesign it. We've got to, we actually we had to start building within three months. So it, it was a very fast process. Now, in the government one, they took out their designs from the 1990s and said you can have either plan A, B, C or D, you know, wh whatever your school is. But in our case, we were able to go out and do this. Now, underneath the space, because we could go five metres up, at this lower level here, we got a complete empty floor. Now, rather than fill that out in the first instance, I knew that my design and technology teachers would have built four classrooms at the time if I'd actually said to them, what do you want? And with designing a design studio, it's our sort of version of an architect studio, and a production suite on the other side separated by a glass wall. Now you can write on the orange and the white, you can write on the glass going through. Um, the teachers made the big mental jump. They didn't have to worry about keeping year eight separate from year 11. They can actually all share that, you know, they, they mightn't be team teaching, but they can collaborate in the use of space. And that was actually a mental shift that they made. And when they made that shift, the whole thing changed. So that, if you talk about how do you empower people to actually to, to change, collaboration and team teaching needs to be viewed in multiple ways beyond sharing curriculum. It has to be the sharing of space and getting your head around that one. We actually didn't buy any furniture for the space either. I just simply walked around the school to other areas where we'd had plenty of furniture and thought, OK, we'll just take those, we'll take those, we'll take those, we'll bring it together. And then it was enhanced by some of our ground staff who found our old whiteboards from underneath the building and said, we can turn those into tables. And again, we started to do that. And it's a, it's a highly flexible area. It's probably the, the room that most secondary students most love because it's like a large lounge room. Um, not wanting to do ice space, our, our sprung floor stage has a, uh, has a mirrored retractable wall and then a side section there which we can completely blacken out for a performance but in the meantime every day it's our drama studio and our dance studio and, uh, and it's quite a nice space and it, it also um, ironically means that there's no garbage dump of stuff on the stage. I mean, how many stages in schools do you go to where very quickly they become the storeroom that no one can see? Um, we also then explored uh, outside. Now, in the Australian context, grass wouldn't grow, so that's synthetic. But the idea of saying, rather than having tables, what would happen if we built little fake hills? Those hills are jumped on, sat on, guitars played on, red, whatever else happens every, every second of the day going through. And it's, it's actually cheaper than, than outdoor furniture when you, we did it. And it was interesting when we went, went to build it, the um, guy came out to do it for us and he said, where were the plans? And I said, it's in my head and in your hand. <laughs> I said, I want two little hills, not so high that someone's going to fall over them, um, large enough so that you can get about 30 kids sitting on them. And then he built those. We've got them primary and secondary. We also played with table shapes and picked up a smaller version of that from Sweden and then immediately as we used it we recognised that a, 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 um, a plectrum shaped table is far better for collaboration than even a round table for, kids, for school kids. Now the Swedish ones were, are a little bit smaller so we now have those in four sizes in the school. We can have some that set up to nine, some that set up to six, three and one. We also then thought, okay, what about the existing spaces where we don't want to, we can't change the walls or anything else? Um, again, we started playing with furniture design. Now, the interesting thing is that the chairs here, 
which replaced a desk, a chair and a locker were designed by one of our students and then we had them commercially produced so that they are extremely comfortable and functional because you can just sort of throw your bag in, inside them. Um, some other students now have actually started to explore in a project that we have with Year 11. They've got to create robust furniture, strong enough for someone like me to sit down and to, to move around. It has to cost less than $5 per piece, so that means that you're restricted to two pieces of cardboard and you can't use glue or sticky tape. So you've actually got to do it entirely through structural robust strength and they've actually created multiple designs that work around and we're going to get some of those commercially produced because they're so effective. That came from students. An ordinary classroom space uh, used for secondary English and history especially. Painted the wall with idea paint. Um, we have the tables a little bit like a sort of a coffee lounge and uh, the, the, it's an ergonomic lounge that we had designed to replicate the ergonomics of a Swedish chair. And what was a congested classroom full of 18, or oh, sorry, um, 16 double desks facing the front beforehand with an electronic whiteboard no longer has an electronic whiteboard kids have got their own personal device and we've got a third of the space of the room is now empty. So it's a far more flexible space without having to do anything else. Um, year, in years five and six we have a program of 180 students with six teachers together all day long. It's one class so that there are six adults and 180 students in the class. When parents then ask me about class size, you know, what's our class size formula in the school, and they're hoping they're going to say sort of 24.2 or whatever else they might come up with, and the magic number that they've heard from someone is the perfect size. We will say we have 180 <laughs> and uh, wait for a response to that because I've never actually seen such outstanding personalised learning occurring as is in the space. It's now our fourth year of operation and I've not had one child referred to me from that program for four years for misbehaviour. It's completely transformed the teachers' roles and they have evolved probably the, um, the most advanced version of collaborative teaching that I've ever seen anywhere and the teachers are now doing that themselves each day. So they start each day um, like doctors, ha having a conference about the patients. They talk about the different kids in the class and they talk about the program and the program is divided up into a quarter of the day literacy, quarter of the day numeracy and half the day is integrated um, study.